money that we took. So in 2021 is when I joined Utah, and we went all in to product led by 2022. And then uh, by 2023, where we are now, we successfully pivoted the organization from a sales led org into a product led org. Uh, so I'm going to bring you through all the steps of how we managed to do that. Cool. So our story starts with a sales led org. We were building by feature request to seal the deal. Many of you in your audience probably do that. <laughs> so it's uh, pretty common to put things where they're not supposed to be in, in products just to get some cash, get some cash in the bank. Um, and yeah, like someone's done that to this poor car. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's pretty standard in sales led sales led boards where you're not building uh, for real value for your user base. You're building to seal the deal. And then the other problem is building anything to sell, right? So it, it won't fit your market, but it might fit the market for that one customer just, you know, just to close a deal. Uh, you'll sell your kidney if you have to. Cool, so neither of these approaches actually help you get product market fit. They're really bad. And you end up with products that just doesn't work anymore. So, um, yeah, we want to move away from that, right? We don't want to be in an organization that's purely sales led and you're releasing crappy product. You don't want to be in that position. So, changing your product to close the sale can actually destroy your product market fit. That's what I'm getting at here. There's a nice little Venn diagram. And in the Venn diagram, there's your product, there's the market. Oh, look, there's a nice split in the middle. However, over time, when you're building these random feature requests, your product market fit, fit gets eaten away at, right? You have all these random feature requests coming in, eventually you divorce the market. And you end up in a situation where your product self-destructs. You no longer have product market fit, you're screwed. You're all out of the job. <laughs> so you don't want to be in that position, right? Um, so how do you pivot from a sales-led organization, which is self-destructed, a feature factory, to a product led org? How do you go through that process? So here's eight tips for becoming product led. Tip number one, find pain in the day-to-day -day jobs that your product does. What do I mean by that? I've got a little picture up here of a book. Um, it's, it's the book called Jobs Be Done by Anthony Owick. Um, I took uh, learnings from that book and put it here, and I'm gonna show you all how to apply that now. So the first thing you do is, you write down the jobs that you do and the jobs that your customers do. Note that I mentioned the jobs that you do as well as your customer does. Because the jobs that you do internally, if they're slow and there's friction points, it will stop you from creating the product. So you also have to find internal pain as well, right? So write down the jobs that you do and the, job, the jobs that your customers do. The next thing you do is you map out the steps taken to complete those jobs. And this side down here is, is taken from like many different uh, jobs to be done uh, framework sheets, and we'll go through that in a bit. Uh, but you basically map out every step in that job that is needed to get the job done. And then finally, what you do is you highlight the steps that cause the most pain or waste the most time. So, what does that look like? This is a job map worksheet, and my day job, I'm actually a builder. Okay, <laughs> well, I'm a builder in this example. Um, I'm building a wall. And the first thing you need to do to build a wall is to find the number of bricks needed to build that wall. Then you locate the site where the wall will be built, and you prepare the cement to stick the bricks together, and then you validate the density of the cement, perform the laying of the bricks, verify that the bricks are well placed, and then adjust the cement in the bricks, and then finally you want to close the bill of the customer, right? Because that's why you did the job. So, You've, you've, what you've done is you've taken a job, in this case building a wall, you've mapped out all the steps of that job, and now you need to find the pain in that job. Ah, the pain is that, and you can't see it, the customer is trying to bargain with me. Okay, so I found pain in my day-to-day -day job, the job that I've mapped out, and I will take that pain and use it. So, you found the pain that way. So you can apply that model to any, any job in your org, and you obviously will prioritize by jobs which are most valuable for your organization, but you found the pain which wastes time. Now you need to agree on the actions to take. So you need to focus the org to take action. 
So how do you do that? Usually what happens is, in, in a traditional structure, is you get top-down objectives. You get top-down initiatives. However, the best way to build is to make sure that you have, you need focus on top of the org, right? So you have all level OKRs, all level objective key results that you can work with, and you can have top-down focus, that's fine. But what's really important is that you're planning upwards with squad level OKRs. So instead of just having the top-down focus, you also plan upwards with squad level OKRs, which traditionally are not actually trickled down from all OKRs, but more recently, it's much better to build that way. So just here for the people who don't know what OKRs are, um, OKRs are objective key results. You have an objective, that's where you want to get to. You have key results, and that's how you measure the progress towards the objective. To give you my rules of thumb to OKRs, when you're saying uh, OKR, or objective key results, make it exciting, make it difficult to attain. Your 100% it's now 70%, right? You want to challenge your team. You want them to think outside the box and build something new, something that's, you know, a tenant's idea even, right? Um, and you want to make sure that all the metrics are measurable. You don't just choose a random metric. You have to choose metrics that you can realistically measure. Something which is closer to a leading indicator for your team rather than something which they have no control of. Um, you need a numeric value, something moving from and to. And you should have, as I mentioned, squad level and bucket level OKRs. Here's an example. So, a good objective is to make creating a reservation system a wonderful self-service experience. Exciting. You want to create a wonderful experience for your users. Your team are like, wow, you get to create a wonderful product. That's great. What about the key result? Okay. I'm going to increase self-service conversion from 15 to 25%. Wow, 10% leap. That's massive. So, oh, so in this case, it's exciting and measurable and difficult to key result. So that's a strong OKR. Okay, a lot of this theory comes from Measure What Matters by John Dewar. And uh, I created a video on this a couple of years ago. I'll share the deck later uh, so that everybody can watch the video. Uh, it talks a lot more about um, empowered, empowered squads and making sure that um, the OKRs come from top down and bottom up. Cool. Um, <laughs> uh, cool. uh, it's an all focus and execute, right? You've got to a point where your organization is focused and executing using OKRs, and your team is empowered because they have OKRs too. Fantastic. What's the next step? Research to discover. So, discover and ship value frequently. That's my third tip. Usually, what happens is you align with your team, you hit, hit a point of peak certainty and then you refine again and keep shipping value. The idea here is, is that you don't delay product delivery if you're already certain you're going to ship some form of value. There's no point of over planning and having a long build time if you can ship value faster. So you've probably all seen this. Many of you might not, but it's quite a popular um, uh, image. Um, the idea here is, is that instead of building something which takes three, four, five, six months to build, because you have to plan it out and somebody had to, somebody wants it to feel like a product project manager. The best thing to actually do is to ship iteratively. Ship in one week, two weeks, sprints, and make sure that every time you ship, you're delivering value to your customer. This is really important because what your goal actually is is to validate that a solution you're bringing to your target audience is actually useful for them. And if you spend three to six months doing that, you might actually kill your business. So the best thing to do here is to um, ship value frequently and don't delay. Cool. Uh, again, I've got a video on this one, which is um, uh, product manager supply, building the right thing. And so uh, I'll share it afterwards. Uh, feel free to give it a watch. Uh, it talks everything about uh, working with your stakeholders, seeing it from their lens, aligning your team and focusing on the problem space before diving into solutions, as well as iterating first. Cool, uh, so you've made discoveries. You were shipping value fast, now you've made discoveries. What's next? You need to agree on the changes needed to pivot your org in the right way. Well, tip number four is that insights will help you agree on changes. Actually, you've got some great insights, because the first three tips went over exactly how we can gain those insights. 
The first thing we broke down the jobs and we found pain in day to day. We found those painful jobs. If you ask yourself why were those jobs painful, you will find insights. So that's your first set of armorized insights. Your second set is from discovered opportunities. You've discovered opportunities. Why did you agree with your team that they all discovered opportunities? What are the data points that drive that and support that? Put that together and you have insights. So you have more insights from the discovered opportunities. And finally, you've measured experiments and found trends. Now that you've measured experiments and found trends, ask, okay, why are these trends? And then you have your insights. So if you have a big armorized group of insights that you can now bring back to your organization or your team to make positive change and help your org get out of that red tape, uh, unnecessary approval by situation. Cool, so insights led to agreements. You agree with all the management, the top management in your organization that this is the way to go because you have data and you have insights. Now you're going to pivot to a product-led org structure. So tip number five is to pivot your org structure around the customer. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is traditionally the old org structures had tech who were focused on building the product. They had marketing, they get tracker. You have inbound sales who sell the vision. You've got account support who make sure people renew. And you have finance who are focused on just collecting money. Every single one of these departments is a silo. Silos don't help you make a product. Silos don't help you solve problems or bring value in a way which will make your company successful. So this is the old departmental structure that pretty much all of us have experienced or are currently in the situation. But how do you change that? What you do is you create an outcome-based org structure. That means that um, you use the discovery and the insights that you got earlier to make a decision on how you structure your org around the outcome. In this case, um, at ETA, we found that discovery showed us we need to increase our activation. That means that we need to help customers get value out of the products and pay. Uh, so we created the activation trial. So that's a trial for those who don't know. It's a group of teams. It's a group of teams or a, 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 a group of shared vision with multiple teams in one, in one yeah, group. Uh, so uh, what we also found is that Discovery showed us we need to increase our retention. So we created the retention tribe. And the retention tribe just focuses on making sure customers are actually happy. No, no opinions, just pure outcome and uh, measurable. So we restructured around that. We took all of these chapters, all of these specialist roles in our um, organization, and we put them into two tribes. And we split them based upon their skill set and what's most valuable. So now we've restructured. We've restructured the team in that way. We now need to measure uh, effectively. So tip number six is to measure your org like a pirate. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about pirate measures. So there's a book called Lean Analytics that popularized the, uh, the pirate metrics framework. And the reason why I love this framework is because it allows you to measure your product like a funnel from start to end. Everything from awareness, how many people know about your product, all the way to referral, how many customers um, are willing to uh, recommend your product to their friends. Uh, so let me take you through this. Awareness, that's the number of um, uh, uh, people who are aware of your product, right? You have uh, acquisition and activation, the number of people using your product, and the number of people actually um, willing to pay for your product. And then on revenue, you have uh, your, your, your earnings, right? You're making your uh, company successful by also making money, especially in this time. It's super important to grow uh, profitably. So uh, revenue is the next step. And then retention, you want customers to renew. You want customers to come back. You want customers to keep using your product over time. So this is why I love pirate metrics. And we spoke about it earlier. We formed the company into two tribes, the activation tribe and the retention tribe. The activation tribe focuses on the top of that funnel. It focuses on awareness, number of signups. It focuses on um, activation, acquisition. 
the, no the number of quality signups, the, no the percent of used features. And on the retention side, we're focusing on ret retention, most importantly, the, no the percent of retained customers, but also referral, the chance of word of mouth. What is the chance that a customer is going to recommend my product to their friend? And then finally, across both, both tribes, because it's key at the moment, is revenue, which is the percent of customers who check out both old customers and new customers. So that's what we did. We split the org into these two tribes and made pyrometrics out of it, right? So we've got the whole organization shouting an R. Uh, I was waiting for that part, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, cool. <laughs> Everyone shut you are uh, have a self servable product. Do we? Well, let's find out. So tip number seven is to help your customers self-serve. Um, self-serve means that customers can do three things, and it fits into three buckets. The first one is configure the product. That means that they can configure the accounts by themselves. You don't have a sales rep configuring for them, they can actually use the product to do that by themselves. The second one is allowing them to upgrade or pay for the product by themselves. That includes add-ons or packages. They're able to improve their experience themselves by checking out. And then the third one is viewing reports. And the reason why viewing reports is so important is because they need to be able to share and see product value themselves. So these are the three buckets of self-serve that will help make sure that your organization succeeds in this case. So, why do I like these three buckets? Because pyrometrics, again. So, on the activation side, if customers can configure the account themselves, then you are, you are catalyzing the activation of your product. If customers can check out themselves, you're gaining revenue for your company. And finally, on the retention side, if customers actually could see value and share value, the likelihood of them staying on your platform and you retaining those customers is significantly higher. So this is uh, called a reverse trial model. Usually what you've seen maybe a few years back is products will have a trial option where you can trial the product for 14 days and then after those 14 days, game over, right? You have to like sign up again with a, uh, another email address and continue. <laughs> but, uh, now these days the way it works is you don't just have that 14 day trial, you probably do uh, products now where after 40 days they, they, they automatically move you over to a free tip or they ask you if you want a cheaper tip because they know that you haven't checked out to the product. So this is called the reverse trial model and this has been popularized by Elena Werner. Elena Werner is um, a PLG enthusiast uh, and has worked with some very, very successful companies. Um, and so I'm um, yeah, quite inspired by her work and uh, this is where I stole this from. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the reverse trial model uh, is fantastic. I recommend giving it a go for all B2B companies and I, I think even some B2C companies will benefit from this as well. So the idea here is that after that we get trial, we can downgrade or it, we get feature gains. That means that there's certain features or add-ons in the product that they cannot get full access to. But if they want full access, they have to pay some DOSH. So then that means that there's a higher chance of conversion. So usually what happens is after that 14 day free trial, you get a 30, 40, 50% drop off. Customers aren't willing to pay for your product. However, if you can incentivize them to stay, you can capture a portion of that uh, percent of customers who dropped off with the reverse trial model, allowing them to downgrade feature gain and usage limit. Cool. So just to give you an idea of how self-serve has helped eat up, this is like real numbers on time to conversion um, and from sign up. Time to conversion from sign up. And in a one year period, we've reduced that by 10x. So it originally took 90 days for a customer to, to convert a product. And since we've had a self-serve motion and made it so the customers can do everything themselves, we brought that down to nine days and actually even less in some cases. So, hear it from me, self-serve is amazing, it works. Uh, and if you're in a B2B company, like, start to find ways to automate everything that your sales team does, sorry, sales team in the audience. Cool. So you have a self-serve product. What's next? You need to expose your funnel. What do I mean by exposing the funnel? Well, and what I'm saying is, is you need real-time funnel events. 
Real time common events that can help your team. That's tip number eight. Expose real time common events to help your team act upon user behavior. So here's three examples that I took from Slack, from, from our Slack channel on Ether. Um, so when a customer completes a self serve checkout on our products, we just put this in Slack and all of our team can see it. The package type, where they checked out from, the email address, their name, their role at the company, all of this information becomes available on Slack. If you have a, a product like Lotion, there's no way you're going to be able to go immediately to product led. You need to assist your sales team to make sure that they can help you become product led, right? And you learn faster that way. So what you do is you expose these real-time funnel events in a way so they can immediately speak to the customer and understand exactly what the customer wants and feed that back to you. Essentially, this enables you to make your uh, sales team your spies. So you can actually let them do the customer research for you. The next one is checking out with add-ons. And this one's really important because when a customer checks out with add-ons, they're showing that they like the value that you could potentially bring them, right? So they pay for an add-on, you know, okay, well, if people are willing to pay money for this, we can invest more time in it. So having those real-time funnel events telling you when someone checks out, not just pay, not just behavioral data, but also, <coughs> but also to show um, your, your team who to speak to next or immediately. Cool. The uh, next one is when they've actually com completely set up on your add-on. If you know that someone's just going to set up an add-on, you can find out immediately what pain points they've had whilst it's fresh in their mind. So empower your company with real-time fun with that. The next part of this is empower, exposing user behavior to help your marketing team, right? Empowering your marketing team. So gamification, you've probably heard the buzzword of gamification, right? But actually, gamification is one of the most powerful tools you can have in a B2C or B2E product. It's basically where you take the product that you have, you break it down step by step, and you provide a way for your customers to activate themselves proactively. So what we've done here at Eta is we identified the core jobs that a customer wants to do in the product, and we show them step by step if they set it up or not. And once they set up the job, we send them another email saying, hey, you've got to step three, maybe you should get to step four. And we, this was not possible until we exposed user behavior to our marketing team, not just transaction there. Cool. So, fantastic. You've enabled your whole company. You've enabled marketing and sales and all of your customer support to look at real-time funnel with us. That's great. So, what's next? You need to enable an experimentation culture. Well, it's a bit of a trick question because have you enabled that? You have. Because you've already empowered your product teams. Um, you're already using discovery methodologies. You've already focused your teams on open ours. You're shipping fast. You've got structured org for outcome. You've got funnel metrics. You've got the whole world shouting R. And you've got self-serve measurables and behavioral traffic. You are ready to start experimenting as a company. So, experimentation goals have been enabled. Well done. If you got this far, you're already close to being product led. Well, are you product led now? Let me know. Connect with me and you can get the deck and ask me any questions you like. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Thanks everyone for uh, joining Joseph. Super insightful. Uh, I have seen this presentation before and uh, with took a lot of insights and I think it's great that someone is doing this in the region and they are also you know, interested and willing to explore the, uh, the insight with us. So we're gonna, I will just announce that we're gonna skip the Q&A for today.